I just got a little baby, so I got it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got three. Right. Yeah. He won, so I'm like. First of all, thank you guys for coming today and welcome to our grand reopening of the North Branch. And is this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And just to let you know, you are our first audience in our new multi-purpose room. So give yourselves a round of applause. Definitely. This is, this is your building. This is for you. You know, um, and like, you know, Dr. Hill was saying downstairs, you know, um, information is everything, you know. Um, and if you want to get real about it, they say the best place to hide information is in a book <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> certain, certain communities. So now, and this is why the Women's Library wanted to give you not only books, not only programs, but the greats of the world. The greats yes. like Dr. Hill. Yes. The greats like Dr. Shabazz. You know, and today they're going to be sharing just their thoughts, you know, their 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 inspirations, um, what what moves them, what should allow uh, things like things that should allow us to be, be, be moved by and be inspired by. So we could take that next step in our career, in our life, in our journey, and with our families. So without further ado, Dr. Shabazz. Powerful mics. Thank y'all for coming and supporting us on a Saturday. It's, a, it's so beautiful to see so many uh, so many people here for the opening of a library. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and we're blessed to have Dr. Ilyasa Shabazz here with us. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. I know. I saw you February 21st at my father's memorial celebration. We were so honored to have Dr. Mark Lamont Hill uh, as our MC while we welcomed Dr. Angela Davis to the Shabazz Center and several others Ben Crump, oh, yeah. Amy Goodman, Joy, Joy Reed. Reed. Right. And to have you as our MC was a dream come true. It was an honor, and we hope to see you again May 19th for <laughs> the that, next celebration. That is both compliment and request. Yes, I got you. I got you. And But it was just a blessing. You know, I, I had a very busy week that week, and uh, then you, you asked me to come, and I said, yeah, I mean, I, how can I say no to that? You know, Malcolm X's daughter says, hey, can you come up and MC the event memorializing, you know, uh, your, your father's tragic passing? But it's not just that your father means so much to me. It's it's what you mean to us. Yeah. It's what you yes. mean to us. You know? right. yes. 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 That's important. Yes. You are in an interesting position. Your father is one of the most significant figures to ever be produced in this country. Yes. yes. He means so much to everybody in this room, everybody around the country, everybody around the world. And yet. You managed to follow in that tradition in your own way, um, not just your father's tradition, but also your mother's tradition. What does it mean for you to be in that tradition? What does it mean for you to follow the legacy? And you know, honestly, um, it wasn't like I set out. I guess we don't need microphones, right? It wasn't like I set out to follow in anybody's legacy or to. Or to, it, or in, to be in my, my mother or father's footsteps. But I think it's the way my mother raised us. You know, when she lost her life, I took a step back and I looked at this woman 
you know, who was just in her 20s when she witnessed her husband's assassination. Mm -hmm. A week prior to that, she lay in bed with her husband as a firebomb was thrown in, in, in the room where her baby slept and she was pregnant. And to have been able to raise six girls, you know, with specific values, you know, to be proud of who they were as women, as Muslim, as people of the African diaspora, yeah. you, know, to have a, you know, to be able to st stand on our own, I just thought was amazing, mm -hmm. you know? And I often question how did she do it? Because she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself mm -hmm. because she understood who she was. Yes. You know, she knew her history, her identity was yes. intact, and her girls did not rely on other people to determine our self-worth because of what she instilled in us. And so that's what I set out to do with my books, to make sure that when a child opens up a book, that they could see a reflection of, of themselves, and also that they could learn the truth about Malcolm X, about Betty Shabazz, about our our ancestors, our foreparents. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love your books um, because they attempt to tell the proper story of who your parents were and who all of us can be. Who, who was young Malcolm? Right, who we are, right? So my father, you know, there's this whole notion that you go, that, you, that you're an illiterate, right? And that you go to jail and miraculously walk out as an icon, <laughs> right? And so the reason that my father was able to walk out as Malcolm X is because his father and his mother instilled specific values and they, they provided yeah. a foundation. Yes. 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 And it says that it does take a village to raise your right. children. Yes. And that it is our responsibility to provide a foundation for yes. all of our children, yes. whether we biologically birth them or not, rather than think that somehow magically their, their, their education curriculum is gonna do the right thing. Uh -huh. You know, but instead of thinking and sitting back and waiting and complaining about our education curriculum, we know, like Malcolm's parents and like our four parents, that we have to do the work. And so Malcolm's father was a member of the PTA. He, he purchased land that was reserved for whites only during the height of Jim Crow. They told him, you can buy the land, but you can't live on it. And so we know <laughs> that he said, okay, but he and his family lived on the land. And that's how Malcolm, you know, seeing these parents that he perceived to be invincible. Mm -hmm. His mother instilled um, the desire to read. You know, she was a polyglot. She spoke many languages. Mm -hmm. And so she instilled these values of excellence in her children. They knew who they were. She, her, her, his father was the uh, pre chapter president of the Garvey Movement, Uni Universal Negro Improvement Association, um, which was very important during that time of, the, of our um, history, of our contemporary history in America. And, um, you know, so they instilled great values. We as a family knew that our history didn't begin in slavery, but that we were trafficked, our bodies were trafficked, we were kidnapped, we were held in bondage against our will and all these horrible error, you know, these things. And the reason that I, you know, wanted to go to the Whitney Plantation while I was in um, New Orleans. Um, but just understanding, you know, the trauma that happened, but knowing that the reason the trauma happened is because people, you know, unfortunately try to crush us. And it makes me think of Toni Morrison when she said, who are you without your oppression? Mm -hmm. Who are you without your racism? Who mm -hmm. are you without the ability to imprison me, right? You're just an insecure little old self, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's, it's mm -hmm. having the conversation like my father said. Yes. Do you, do you think about, well, I think about, I'll ask you, I'll tell you what I think about. I often think about who your father would have been. His trajectory is so extraordinary. 
from 48 to 52, from 52 to 65, just even from 64 to 65. 19. Yeah, 19, so yeah, I'm sorry, yes, I'm talking about these years, not his age. Um, for, it, oh, in these specific years, I, we saw these radical changes in, in shifts. And I, often, and, and, and I think the saddest part, and I thought about this yesterday because um, Carolyn Bryant, the, the woman who, uh, who lied on Emmett Till, uh, who caused his death, she got to live to be 88. 88. And poor Emmett Till, right. yeah. you know, 30, yeah, 14, mm -hmm. you know, when he died at 55. And I think mm -hmm. how profoundly unfair it is that we never got to see who Emmett Till could be, mm -hmm. what he could be. And I think about that with your father. I think, you know, God, yeah. what, he, what, what, he means to, uh, what he means to us as a martyr, but what he could have meant to us living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much more. As his child, is that something that you think about? Like the, the what is, the what could have, or is that, is that even possible? No, I don't think of that. Um, you know, I accept the life that we have mm -hmm. and try to learn from the challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm grateful that my father lived the time that he did, that he got to go and make his Hajj and experience the first world nation. Mm -hmm. You know, the land of the Bible, the land of the Quran, the land of the Torah. You know, I'm so grateful for his experience. Yeah. You know, things that sometimes we take for granted, right? Okay? But understanding that he was just a young man. He was only 39 when he was born. Yeah. So to have can make this enormous contribution at such a young age and sacrifice because of his love for his people and his belief in our humanity. Um, so I don't, I don't really think about that. I, you know, try to be as realistic, you know, and, yeah. and current as possible. Talk to me about your, talk to me about your mother. You know, one of the things, and I, and I talked to Bernice King about this as well. There's a way that we think that these larger than life men navigate the world alone, or that their wives are just kind of like side. Uh, or, or, or not, not there's sort of additions to the story, but they're not central to it. And there's no Martin without Coretta. There's no Nelson without Betty. And there's no Malcolm without Betty. But I think we don't tell that story. Who is Betty Shabbat? So, you know, I wrote this other book, Betty Before X. Yes. <laughs> and I just, you know, when, when, while writing it, like I learned that my mother played the drums as a mm. child. You know, just so many things I learned that um, she, her household environment comprised of women, you know, and being in the church, who were the leaders of the Housewives League that challenged um, the meatpacking industry that would not hire black people. And they said, and these are women, and they said, if you, if you can take our money, then you can employ our children and our yes. husbands. And there were women who, who challenged this, I think, billion dollar industry, you know, to ensure that um, we were hired. And, you know, my mother grew up in the church, you, you, you know, so many things. I remember when I was, um, you know, maybe in the 90s, I said, gosh, mom, you know, you need to read Deepak Chopra's universe, seven principles of spiritual success. And she said, seven, seven principles of spiritual success. She said, you need to work. <laughs> you know, like, and so I said, gosh, you know, she needs to be softer. She needs to feel the spiritual world. And of course, when she passed away, I said, of course she was. That's how she survived, right? Right. 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 And so writing um, Betty Before X just helped me see why my mother, why my father chose her as his wife. There's some writers in the room, I'm sure. I mean, anybody here a writer? I ain't never been to a library where writer. <laughs> and I want to make sure that the next generation of young writers and are are sort of prepared for that journey. What does it mean to you to be a writer, and, and why do you write? So, you know, when I was growing up, I loved writing. I loved storytelling. I loved choreographing. I loved the arts and music, and 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 but I thought because I loved it so much, that that wasn't going to be my job. Mm. That my job had to be something that I didn't like, mm. right? Wow. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go to, 
I was started off as a math major until I went to college, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> and then, you know, I decided I was going to be a medical doctor, and, you know, I'm not really fond of blood and germs and all that stuff, so okay. that didn't... That ain't the business. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, you know, what I realized is that for our young people, that when we choose our careers, that it, it shouldn't be based on how we're going to how much money we're going to make, right? Mm -hmm. But what are we passionate about? Yes. You know, what are, and, and I just enjoyed writing and creating stories. And especially because when I grew up, I didn't read Dick Jane and Spock, right? We learned about um, the Malian Empire, how, you know, they created books that they, they wrote the first books. Had it not been for them, we would never have a book, right? And we learned about the scientists and archaeologists and farmers of the continent, about the founders of civilization. And so we were really, you know, balanced. And when I went to a girl girls prep school, boarding school, um, I would mentor and tutor math, because that was my subject, to uh, young people. And I didn't understand why they were withdrawn, mm. right? That they weren't animated and lively, right? And then going to college and going and, and, and working in lockup facilities, and again seeing young people who weren't animated and loving and excited about life, like my sisters and I have five sisters, six of us close in age growing up together. We were animated and lively, and we loved ourselves. And it, it dawned on me that they did not have the same upbringing that I had. Mm -hmm. And so I made sure that whatever it was I did, that I provided a curriculum where they could know their value, their worth, mm -hmm. and find their joys and their passions. Mm -hmm. What you gonna write next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm actually, so you know, I have to take it off my social media, because I'm like, oh, maybe I better wait till I have it, because I don't want anybody to stop me from making it happen. But we are, um, with Sony TriStar, mm. doing um, television series about the awakening of Malcolm X, just to make sure that that is, it's accurate. My right. father grew up in the Midwest, yeah. in the rural Midwest. Mm. He was, you know, and it was a really exciting childhood for him. And when I wrote the uh, Malcolm Little, the boy group to become Malcolm X with an illustrator, the images that they were bringing were of this little boy with cut off or ripped off overalls and barefoot. And I was like, pull the pants down to his ankles and put some shoes on. Right. <laughs> you know, and so it's so important that we control the narrative yes. of our story. Right. 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 I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to take two questions from you all. Do you ever feel, as a writer, and I feel like this sometimes, that because of who you are in the world, you can't, there's certain things you'd love to write but can't? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I write about what I want to write about. You know, because I believe, you know, God is the judge, you know, not people. And I want to be in tune with what I like and what I don't like. But then I know that like say if I posted something about um, a new pair of shoes or right, you know that you know you have those people who make the remarks, sister, sister, you know, whatever about shoes or or when I was in college and I had on lipstick and the you know someone said sister you know that's swine on your lips and so I asked my mother can I wear lipstick she said girl if you want to wear lipstick wear the lipstick enjoy it you know. um, but again that's being com you know, comfortable in the skin you're in. Yeah. That's an important lesson for everybody out here, particularly the young writers. Don't confine yourself. Don't constrain yourself. Mm -hmm. Write about what you want to write about. That doesn't mean that you have responsibilities. Right. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about our people, think about justice, think about freedom. But there's a space for joy. There's a space for love. You can write a novel. You can write a romance novel. You can write a children's book. You can write an adult book. You can write a research paper. You can write a, a poem. Like There's a range of ways to be a writer. And, and don't limit yourself or, or let the world tell you that you can't do those things. Uh, we got time for just two questions before we wrap. Yeah, we'll go right here. A couple things. 
Um, oh, we have time for just a single question. <laughs> there has to be an actual question. See, now what I'm going to do is... Okay. Oh, this is not Philadelphia. This, so close to Philadelphia. This, this counts. I'm Philly. If you ever get a chance, go to Uncle Bobby's coffee shop. Oh, <laughs> talk as long as you do it. Talk your talk. Take the time. Okay. 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 Your father was a big influence on me. I never met him. I was one of the founders of the National Black Holistic Society. Mm -hmm. I spent Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and usually the week between Christmas and New Year's <coughs> for years with your mother. Okay, and I want to tell people, Malcolm had a big impact on me. Sister Betty had a bigger impact because most people don't know how great her mother really was. Yeah. And the fact that she ended up at Megas Eggers College mm -hmm. in New York, Brooklyn, teaching right. <laughs> was a fantastic woman. Yes. And in fact, when she passed, the place that called King's Lodge in New York, mm -hmm. yep. that we held retreats at, changed the name to, to Betty Shabazz Holistic Center. Yeah. And I just want to thank you. You know, and I just want to say, you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And there are so many times when I take a step back and I look at the woman, not the mother that I have, mm -hmm. but the woman that I have the opportunity to know, mm -hmm. to learn from, you know, that I have the opportunity to learn what the, the importance of self-love. When she taught her girls, the environment that she provided for us was very strategic and in retrospect. We had a, a statue of this woman that was carved in Haiti, walk in, in a walking uh, motion, holding a, a child in hand, a basket on her head. And it said that you can do anything that you want. And, and, and all of these things that I learned, it was because she wanted us to understand to first love ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. Right. As much as I love me is how I love you. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? yes. And so it is the reason that I can step away from New Orleans and come here for this moment out of love and then go back. Yes. <laughs> right? Right. right? Because you. You know, if we don't love ourselves, if we don't know how to love ourselves, we can't love one another. We don't even want to be with each other. And I think that that was a, a really important lesson that my father provided us, right? And it was a great lesson that my mother said she learned from her husband, as much as she had such an impact on, on her husband. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Doctor. So, so I wanted to just, um, we're, we're all just in awe of you. Uh, there's a lot of girls watching virtually. Um, we have a, a initiative called Girls Can Do Anything here. You talk about self-love, and my question is like, you know, you have this confidence to write what you want, do what you want, wear your bright red lipstick, you're beautiful, but you also not only have that self-love, but you have a sisterhood of six and well beyond of women. There's so many girls who struggle with self-love and sisterhood, not just girls, but women, and building sisterhood with other black women. That how-to, can you say more about that for people who didn't grow up with strong parents like some of us? but the secret to self-love and sisterhood for our girls and women, particularly black girls and black women. You know, again, I think it was the images that my mother provided, right? Because I know even joining a women's organizations that sometimes they're, even though we're in these sisterhoods, you know that there's still some challenges, but I think it's just so important not to forget what history has shown us as far as slavery, right? And all of the effort that went into the self-destruction, right? All of this effort that went into crushing hope and, and, and so forth. But I think, you know, as my mother made sure that we grew up with the images and the historical perspectives and being proud of those um, individuals, 
He spoke about Phyllis Wheatley. We talk about Harriet Tubman. Let's also talk about Cleopatra. You know, let's talk about Queen and Zynga. Let's look at the women king and find pride, you know, in these women and and love on on these women so that we can love ourselves and, and you know. Mm. Everybody and I think it's important to when we go into these sisterhoods that we bring this kind of um, information with us. I love that information. Thank you so much. Everybody, this is uh, an honor. Oh yeah, big time. I consider you a friend, and I still feel honored every time I'm in your presence. Um, I'm grateful that you all share time with us. Uh, we're going to uh, head downstairs and get some books to sign. But other than that, I just want to encourage everybody to keep reading, keep writing, keep building. And that next generation is going to be a little bit closer to freedom than even we were. So thank you. Thank you.